Therefore, therefore, I, Margo Kaiser, the mayor of Capitola, hereby recognize and remember Sterling Nathan Cross for his lifetime of service to the Capitola and the larger Santa Cruz County community. So thank you very much. And I can give anybody this proclamation that would like to receive it on his behalf. All right, and do we have a report on closed session? Good evening, uh, a closed session was had on the item on the agenda and no reportable action was taken. Great, thank you. I'm like, I don't know where to look for her. <laughs> She's over there somewhere. <laughs> and uh, this evening, are there any additional materials? Staff uploaded copies of the presentations for each of tonight's general items to the online agenda packet, a copy of which has been printed at the back of the room, and the council received a copy of these materials before tonight's meeting. Thank you. And we can now go to oral communications by members of the public. Um, these can be on any consent items or any items that are not listed on tonight's actual agenda. You'll have three minutes. My name is Warren Klapic. I live here in the, uh, in Soquel, uh, nearby Capitola. I shoot uh, basketball every uh, day at Jade Street Park. Today at 12.33, I made an emergency call because I saw uh, a gang sign uh, posted uh, with uh, paint on the restroom of the men's uh, restroom that is facing Porter School and so, uh, Capitola Village. So it's not on the side of the community center, but on the other side that is facing Capitola Village. And uh, I think it's a little bit, uh, it's a shame that uh, uh, people are using the playground as a gang hood or something like that to intimidate people. Then I see little kids play in the park with ball and uh, they're socializing with each other and having instruction, elementary school instruction. I think this is more important to uh, 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 to support than uh, anything else. That's all what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you all. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and uh, City Council members. Um, Jerry Jensen. Um, just wanted to um, make sure everybody had um, a couple of safety dates that are coming up. Um, on the 27th, uh, the Britannia Arms is having a fundraising event uh, for um, the Capital Wharf Enhancement Project, um, which is all day long. Um, they'll be donating 50% of all their sales directly back to the Wharf Project, which is amazing. Um, those are um, also anything that is sold that night. So. Um, you know, gift card, uh, any merchandise, anything like that. So hopefully, um, if council is available or city staff or anybody in the public can come out and support the great things that they're doing there. There's also an amazing raffle going on. You have uh, two tickets to Hawaii, um, airfare, airfare for two to Cabo San Lucas. Uh, they have a seven day trip to Honduras. Uh, the gifts are absolutely amazing. They're being donated to them. And so um, hopefully we come out and as a community and support that um, event. And then also just a reminder with the um, uh, Oktoberfest that's coming up on October 14th. Um, and um, that's also going to be benefiting the Capital Wharf Enhancement Project. 
And that's just kind of backing on to the great successful weekend that we had at the Art and Wine Festival this weekend. Um, other than the chamber doing an amazing job again, um, she went, um, had a, a booth down there. It was housed by a lot of our community members, and it was absolutely fabulous, and the community support was amazing. So thank you for your time. Have a great night. Thank you. I bought my water bottle and my raffle ticket, so. <laughs> Any other members of the public or anybody online? There are no attendees with their hands raised, Mayor. Okay, great. We can go to staff. Thanks. Good evening, Mayor and Council. <clears throat> I'm just, I'm here to, this evening just to <clears throat> let everyone know that tomorrow's the gun buyback uh, the, at the Sheriff's Department. And so uh, tomorrow from... 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Sheriff's Office, 5200 Soquel Avenue. Um, with, with the city's donation of $5,000, the other jurisdictions came in and matched that. And then the County Chiefs Association had uh, a, a, some money as well. So we have about $50,000 to purchase rifles and shotguns are $50, handguns are $100, and any assault weapons are $200. So last, or we did this, I think, two or three years ago and ran out of money. So. <laughs> Our goal, we also have staff that's dedicated to that tomorrow, so we're going to have a couple officers there to help process the guns, and we're going to have a couple of our records techs to also be there to help process the guns. So spread the word. I'll, I have some brochures. I'll hand them out to you, and like I said, it's the, it's the staff. So, thank you. Great. Thank you. Any other staff comments? Any council comments? Yeah, I would, um, I'd like to ask staff to, um, on our Friday update, to let us know what's going over at, on at Jade, Jade Street Park, um, what our speaker was referring to, if there's any cleanup necessary or what the plan is for that. Um, and then I also would like to um, acknowledge that our city manager was just sworn in as the vice chair for the operations committee at Central Coast Community Power, where we all receive our wonderful clean energy from. Um, he was nominated and elected by all of his peers, all his, the other city managers um, this morning where we were in Paso Robles. So congratulations to our city manager. I'd like to announce the, uh, or remind everybody about the Capitola Beach Festival coming up at the end of September. Uh, We'll be holding the first paddleboard race on Saturday, September 23rd. Starts at 8 a.m. If you know anybody that's interested in it, it's for youth of all ages. Starts at 8 a.m. You can sign up on our webpage or go to Capitola Beach Festival at gmail.com. And uh, there is a $45 fee, but all the money goes back to the junior guards for Capitola. So it'll be the first time that we've had something like that at our beach festival. I think we should ask the city manager if he'll be ready to paddle. That day, <laughs> I think he paddles once in a while. Thank you. Any other council comments? Um, I have one comment. I just want to um, say that I was really excited. I think probably my first year on council, um, thanks to my fellow council members, we were able to budget for. The blinky lights at the crosswalk of the Stockton Bridge crosswalk, and um, I work in the village. I cross there all the time, and it's just uh, it's great to bring some more safety for all of our pedestrians that come and um, get to see our beautiful village. So, thank you, Public Works, for making that happen. And it was it only took like two days, and it's great, and it it talks and everything. So, yes, it talks. It says the lights are blinking. So. I think um, everybody can put that could, to good use. Um, yes, and thank you also to the Chamber for putting on such a wonderful um, art and wine festival. It was packed in the village, and I think it um, did really well for the businesses. So um, hopefully everybody had a good time. Okay. Do you have any comments? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so we will go down to consent. <clears throat> These can be enacted in one motion in the form listed below. There are uh, no separate discussion unless anybody needs to pull an item, um, and it'll be passed in one motion. I already said that. Anybody care to make a motion? I'll move approval of consent. I'll second. Great. We have a first and a second. Maybe we have a roll call, please. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. 
Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Passes unanimous. Thank you so much. And moving on to general government tonight. Um, item 9A, this is our mall uh, redevelopment land study. So the recommended action tonight is to authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with Cosmont Companies for the Capital Mall Redevelopment Land Use Study in the amount of $25,000. And we have Ms. Herlihy to present. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council. Uh, before you tonight is the Mall Redevelopment Land Use Study. You will recall, uh, well, the mall is a 46-acre site. There is multiple property owners. Is it okay that I'm signed out of Google on this computer? Good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so just an overview of the mall, a 46-acre site. Back in 2019, Malone Geyer Partners submitted an application for redevelopment of the mall. It was um, to redo the commercial, keep some of the commercial buildings, and there'd be a net loss of about 30,000 square feet of commercial, and then to add 637 new residential units. The mall redevelopment was going to be a new lifestyle community with a new main street, open air mall, um, great opportunity for shopping, dining, and entertainment. Um, Cosmont Companies was hired to do a fiscal analysis of the mall at that time. There was a contract for $63,000, and they were doing the, the feasibility of the mall, the study for fiscal analysis, the impact on the city. Um, and then in 2020, after, uh, due to the coronavirus, um, the mall applicant withdrew their application. Um, this year, during our budget, um, meetings, there was a request to put $25,000 towards uh, identifying strategies to support mall redevelopment and also to create a committee uh, to focus on the mall redevelopment. So at this time, staff, with this study that I'll be bringing up, uh, plans to form a technical committee made up of local experts that have, um, that have um, experience with larger development projects, um, and economic and planning background and housing as well. So next slide, please. So the scope of this project is to analyze our existing code to point out um, what areas are assisting the mall and what areas might be getting in the way of mall redevelopment. Then also to provide a, a menu of alternative land use tools for us to consider in the future. And it'll give us an overview of each tool the pros and cons associated with the tool, um, examples of where the, these tools have been used in other places. Um, and then the findings of this uh, research will be presented to the technical committee. And they will, after that, um, make a recommendation to the city council of which tool they think would be best for us to implement in terms of mall redevelopment. Um, so tonight I'm proposing a sole source contract with Cosmont Companies. We have a policy, an administrative policy, regarding sole source in which we don't have to put it out for bid because of um, the knowledge base regarding a certain firm. And since Cosmont did so much work on the original proposal and has a really great understanding of the mall and the history there, we're proposing to utilize Cosmont Companies. And with that, the recommendation for this evening is to authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with Cosmont Companies for the Capitola Mall redevelopment in the amount of $25,000. So with that, I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from council? OK, any uh, public comment on this item? I don't see anybody here. Is there anybody online? There are no speakers with their hands raised, Mayor. Great. We can take it back to Council. Um, thank you to our Council member for bringing this forward. I think it's a great idea. It definitely, most certainly picks up where we left off um, in 2020. 
Um, I'd like for us to, in the scope, make sure that we add in the housing element outcomes. I think that's going to have a significant impact on what this study's outcomes may, or what the outcomes may, what will be presented as outcomes to us, um, because that could significantly change the, the scope of the entire project. Um, so I, I'm guessing that we would align this group, this technical committee, with when we find out more on the housing element, it'd be, it would not be in our favor to start and then have to start again based off of what the housing element um, outcomes are. And then also we worked with MBAP before on a white paper, and I'd like to make sure that we include that in the scope and with the work um, that we've already done um, and bring that back and possibly invite um, an MBAP uh, uh, person to that full committee. I think they're very helpful and, and in the know. Um, but with that, I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve the thing. One second. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with Cosmont Companies for the Capitola Mall redevelopment land use study in the amount of $25,000. I'll second. Great. Motion and a second. May we have a roll call, please. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll go to item 9B. This is the City Hall um, Needs Assessment and Alternatives Analysis. Uh, tonight, recommended action is to authorize the City Manager to execute a professional services agreement with Group for architecture for phase one of the City Hall Sites Needs Assessment and Alternatives Analysis Report in the amount of $49,950. We're back. Thank you. Um, well, I won't repeat what you just said, but tonight we're looking at a contract for the City Hall redevelopment. So we're all familiar with the site. It's comprised of the capital of City Hall, the police station, our museum, our parking lots in the back, um, and it's a seven-acre site. Um, the City Hall and Police Station are older buildings. This evening, while walking down the stairs to come to this meeting, I heard a little bit of a drip noise to the right of the stairs, and it seems like there's some water. So, I, you know, we've got we've had ongoing um, experiences with the age of this building and just things that are happening. But it doesn't look like it's an emergency. But, <laughs> but there, you know, just. Uh, the, the buildings are older, and so it's, it's time to actually study what's going on and talk about the future. Next slide, please. Um, back in March, uh, I came to city, or we discussed this as a goal during our budget cycle and set aside $50,000 in this fiscal year to look at options. Um, so phase one, this is what it, we're really talking about tonight about launching, it will include a description of the structures and the site, an overview, and then visual assessment of the building where an architect will come out and look at the building and give us a visual assessment of the structure, a quantitative breakdown of the current uses, so looking at like the exact square footage of each type of use within City Hall, then look at the functionality of the building for its purpose and how, um, is whether or not those square footages fit within accepted practices within architecture um, and meeting space, and then a qualitative analysis also of the site and looking also at our environmental constraints. We all know this building is located in the floodplain. Um, from that, they'll work with staff on a 20-year projection, which we'll talk about the future needs of the city and see what the spatial needs are as well. And then they'll provide a summary of findings. The phase two, um, I've brought this up before, but it's really looking at public outreach and also uh, feasibility analysis of different scenarios. So I won't go too deep into that this evening. Um, so we put out an RFP and it was out for about two months. And from that, we got four proposals. Um, we chose group four because of their prior experience. They've worked throughout the Bay Area on projects similar to this. They also, um, their Pricing was the best of all the groups. The others, I would say, um, most of them came closer to 200000 So big difference between this proposal and the others. 
And then their understanding of the scope, they've done this a lot. They really uh, have worked within communities and had these public outreach processes in which uh, trying to get community feedback and then come forth with different proposals. So it looks like a great team, um, and that's why they were selected. So for this evening, we're talking about phase one, which came in just under $50,000. Phase two came in around 66000 and after phase one, if the findings, if we hear from the city council that you would like to move into phase two of looking at options, that's when we would come back um, to ask for more money in the budget in order to do that phase two. And tonight, the recommended action is to authorize the city manager to execute a professional service agreement with group four um, for the phase one of city hall sites needs analysis and alternative analysis report in the amount of $49,950. With that, I'm available for questions. Thank you. Um, one of the slides mentioned that the alternatives analysis will refer to sites. So does that mean they're going to look at this site and then also provide potential alternative sites other than just the one that we're currently on or no? You know, that's a possibility that we, if, if they think that that would be, um, that's something we could look at within that. So it could be looking at alternative sites. There's, uh, yeah, unless it, when we get to that stage, if, if we heard from the public and city council not to go there. Right. Okay. But that's part of phase two. That's part of phase yeah. two. Okay. Okay. The phase two was like the goals for like what is city hall, you know, what does it need to accomplish and then looking into those different sites and what options might, might be out there for those. Okay. Cool. Thank you. So, Katie, when I'm looking at phase one, it seems like it's telling me what we already know. We know how big buildings are. We know we're in a flood zone. We know, um, based off of we, what council has already prioritized, which is we need to find a better place for City Hall. Um, tell me a little bit about how necessary it is to kind of evaluate those things in phase one and what's holding us back from just kind of moving this forward right into phase two with the community output, looking at different areas and really investing our dollars in a, yeah, in, in a way that we can get a better outcome, you know, because I feel like after reading phase one, it just seems like the stuff we already know. Yeah. Um, so I think phase one is an important first step, um, but we do know a lot of this information. You know, when we put, when we uh, brought forth that we were putting out an RFP, in the, and that we've done past cities, uh, past studies on this, we do have information on that. I think um, it's an important first step, but we do have a lot of this information. So, um, but it's it's essential when you go out to the public to really have a good summary of what is a snapshot of today. Um, but it go, you know, what we're asking for from the consultant is pretty in depth. Having an architect come out, really look at the structure, give us feedback on that, where um, and assess all of the numbers. But there is quite a bit of that information available already. So, is there anything in phase one that we don't need to ask group four for? <laughs> Are there elements that could could potentially save us money in not having them assess since we've already have completed multiple studies and have felt the water drip on our heads while we walk by. <laughs> we have evidence here. Yeah, I think, um, Julie, would you mind pulling up the slide on phase one? I think a lot of the information on exact like square footages related to the building the site and I and a description of the site those are things we have and we could put together as staff I think it's still an important piece of this but um, so probably like number one we wouldn't need the consultant to do necessarily and that's also the overview the visual assessment is something we could probably have our building official take a look at and give feedback on um, and the quantitative breakdown, we, we know that. We could pull, up, pull together those square footages. And then also our environmental constraints and hazards, we know those pretty well. 
So, so because that's staff time, if we were to remove those um, items from phase one, how much would that possibly save us if we ask group four not to do that? Any idea? I'm sure they would work with us. Um, I'm not quite sure on an amount at this time. So I'm just wondering if it's equivalent to staff time where this is something well, you rather have them do um, because it just, it's a lot of work or is it something that staff can, you know, handle and it saves us $10,000, $15,000? You know, the biggest thing about kind of the, the, the assessment of this facility, this building, is if we want to be comparing it against other alternatives, um, comparing the alternative of renovating the site. You know, what, is, what does it take to renovate the site? So I think, I think the question is, is one for council is, is that going to be a really key piece of information for you to make decisions down the road? It's like, okay, hey, you know, staying here, being on this site, maybe we could get us up to sort of a modern standard office for $10 million. Never going to get us out of the floodplain, but maybe we could do that versus picking up and moving, moving somewhere else. So I think the question is, is we can, the more analysis we do on the building, I think the better the handle we can get on what a potential renovation here would cost. But if we think that no amount of money that we spend is going to get this building out of the floodplain. And so in some ways, if everybody is willing to say, you know, look, let's do some evaluation of the building, but let's know that at the end of the day, it's probably not worth rebuilding this thing. Then I think really to your point, Councilman Brooks, the, it doesn't make sense to do too much like visual assessment of this building. So let me summarize. I think I talked in a circle there. I think we can do the analysis as proposed in phase one, but I think that if the council is pretty much at a point where you think that, look, this building doesn't make a lot of sense to invest money in as it sits because of the floodplain, because of those issues, then I think there's some real obvious ways we could scale this back and save some money. Can I also add? Yeah. Um, one item is that back in 2013, when we went out uh, to the public, with a study and information on what could be done, what we were hearing from the public is we didn't do enough of our homework up first with, with the assessment of the building. So that, that is why we have this piece in there now. But, um, yeah, no, I mean, I, my questions are just based off of the necessity. We've done this. We've been here. We know we're in a flood zone, just like our city manager has said. We know what the implications are if we stay here. Um, I think that's why we prioritize this because we need to know what our other options outside of the flood zone are. We had that conversation during priority. Um, but if you feel that it's necessary, and it's, I, again, I don't know. It's more cost savings to me. because We've spent so much money already analyzing this problem um, that if we're going to save ten to $15,000, those are programs and projects that we can use funds, you know, in the meantime for to fix those water drippage or something going on, you know, in the meantime. So I, but I don't hear a number quite yet. And so I don't know what, so those are my questions. I, I'm sure we can have more conversation later, but that's why I was posing those questions. I think the visual analysis would be one of the larger cuts from the, to have their architect come down and, and see the building and really get a grasp of the situation here because I think they were planning a full day to come down, look at the building, see what's happening. But if we were to take those steps out, we'd probably save probably what you're estimating, around 10, 15. But that's my guess. But at this point, I don't know. Um, if we take that out, though, they can still do the rest of that scope, right? If they don't bring the person down to come look at the building, they can still do all of the other work. Yeah, they can do like the square footage analysis of what our needs would be and what is typical within a building for, you know, for workspace and meeting space and give us an idea of where we are, our current snapshots. So. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I'm noticing in the cost proposal that it, it says that they welcome the opportunity to review the fees and make adjustments to the scope and approach and, and align with our, our needs and our budget. So I think it sounds like there is an opportunity for us to kind of negotiate with them how much of what was on the slide that they do. And I was initially going to suggest that if, if we kind of bring down the scope of what they're doing in phase one, that perhaps we could get them to put some alternative sites in phase one rather than put that in phase two just to get kind of an idea. But in looking at it again, I'm kind of seeing that the alternative sites, it's not just here's three sites and that's that. It's like here's three sites and here's a site plan and here's a breakdown and here's what how here's what we'd recommend. So it's, it's more than just here's alternatives. Um, it's more detailed than that. So I will not suggest that, but I do suggest um, that staff, staff work with uh, Group 4 on kind of negotiating the cost proposal for things that we don't, we don't need, uh, to Councilwoman Brooks's point. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm just curious, um, at what point, if we're changing the scope of what we're requesting, would we have to go out to bid again at any point? So there's no hard and fast rule on that, I think. Okay. I, you know, actually, I, I'd be I welcome of input from our city attorney if she had any input on it. But I don't think that there's a hard and fast rule. If we generally feel like we've described the project well in the RFP and we get different proposals and we ultimately elect to proceed with some elements of the proposal and not others, I think we're in fine shape there. I agree. Thank you. Um, we can take this to public comment. Seeing no one here, do we have anybody online? There are no speakers on Zoom. Okay, thank you. We'll take this back to council um, for any other comments. Yeah, I, I'd like to uh, interject here. I, our police department does a great job. And if you look around other agencies, the same size, their police department is about as big as our whole city hall. So that's another thing to take in, into account. Hopefully they'll do studies to find out how big other departments are, what kind of facilities they have, not just, not just city hall in general, but for everybody. That's included in the scope, right? Yes. City police department, city hall, museum, like everything, everything on this property. On this property. Oh, does it include parking? But it's going to look at the parking lots and how much space we have on the parking lots. But they're not going to going to do an analysis on any kind of parking structures or just anything. You know, they, they might in their scenarios. Oh, okay. So. All right. Phase two. The parking spaces don't get any wider. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should consider that. <laughs> um, Sorry. Okay, uh, with that, I will uh, make a motion to, um, let me go back to the phrasing, authorize the city manager to execute a professional services agreement with Group 4 Architecture for Phase 1 of the City Hall Sites Needs Assessment and an Alternatives Analysis Report in the amount of $49,950 with additional direction to negotiate scope based on what? Based on actual needs. Is that fair? What we can't do ourselves. Yeah, I think is that to repeat, I think what I was hearing from the general discussion, it would be negotiating out some of the, the assessments of this building, putting a lot of time and effort into analyzing what's under the sheetrock in this building may not be something we want to spend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I'll second that. Great. First and a second. Maybe we have a roll call. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Pearson. Aye. Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. This will take us on to 9C. We'll change uh, presenters here. Public Works Director Khan. This is the pedestrian pathway from the Upper Beach and Village parking lot to up to Monterey Avenue. The recommended action tonight is to direct staff to proceed with developing the final design of the pedestrian pathway from the Upper Beach and Village parking lot to Monterey Avenue, consistent with the pathway configuration alternative three, as described in this staff report. All right. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, so just to get us a little bit oriented about where we're talking about, we are here at City Hall. The upper parking lot is above us. Um, and so this is a pathway to take us from the upper lot to the corner of Bay slash Monterey and Park Avenue. Next slide, please. Um, currently, there's not a pathway. This is the idea, is that we're trying to get from the end of the parking lot here up to the street. Next slide, please. Here is our problem. Uh, issue. Um, there's no walkway there. This, I'm sure if you drive up here in the summer, you see this quite often. Next slide, please. So a little bit of background on this project. It's been out there for a while. In uh, 2021, the city went into agreement with the RTC for the study and construction of a pathway, and they committed funds to this project. Um, it's to provide separations between vehicles and pedestrians, obviously. And also, part of the reason they're interested is it provides access to segment 11 of the Coastal Rail Trail that will pick up at Monterey and Park Avenue intersection. Uh, the last time this came to council was February of 2022, where staff permits and did a schematic plan, um, but really no details on the tree removals. Um, and so council directed staff to return with the preliminary design, minimizing impacts to the tree, the oak trees in that area. Um, so with that, staff went back to the drawing board and made the following considerations when uh, coming up with these alternatives. One was sidewalk width, um, one was dry aisle width, then the other was the retaining walls required for the project that would obviously scale the cost of the project. And then with the tree impacts, we uh, considered the number of tree impacts, both removals and, and impacts to the root zone that might damage the tree in, in, for its lifespan. The species of tree is involved because there are a lot of coast live oak in that area. And then, like I said, the severity of the impact to the trees. Next slide. So we came up with three alternatives. The first alternative being the ideal for usability, so the widest sidewalk width and the widest dried aisle width. That has also had the most tree impact. So to reduce tree impact, we tried to shimmy around some of the uh, tree, more, more important, more prominent trees in the area. That was alternative two included in your uh, packet. And while it did save some larger trees of note, it still had similar tree impacts. So the third alternative, which we're recommending this evening, uh, reduces the sidewalk width by about half a foot, reduces the drive aisle width to two 10-foot lanes. There are currently two 11-foot lanes. 10-foot uh, lanes are pretty typical of a uh, small residential street. And then the tree impact is reduced by quite a bit. So four to seven trees with only one oak removed. Next slide. So here's the, uh, rather than trying to go off by memory, the tree impacts here. So this was included in your packet. Red is known removals. Yellow is some that would have an impact. So either retaining wall or the sidewalk would impact the tree root area. And then green is no impact at all. And so you can see here that there's only one uh, tree, oak tree that we know would have to be removed. That would be the same under all three scenarios. And then the other three species of tree, or three trees to be removed are smaller uh, other species of trees. Um, under the other two scenarios, there were definitely way more impacts and removals to the uh, coastal live oak. Next slide. So these are the trees that we're talking about. In scenario three, the only tree to re be removed is a 40 inch tree. Um, in scenario two, we are trying to shimmy around that 18 and 15 inch uh, oaks that are there in the intersection. But like I said, going around there didn't still impacted all the other trees down the line. So it really wasn't saving us the number of trees overall. Next slide. So this is alternative three, just to walk you a little bit through this project. You have your curb cut there all the way on the left. Then the uh, black and white kind of dashed line on the bottom signifies a retaining wall. It would be approximately two feet tall for the duration of the project. There's two um, small trees there in that first section in the next slide. And then the one large oak tree in the next section there. Um, to achieve this configuration of the five foot sidewalk and two drive lanes, we're gonna have to uh, edit the curb cut there at the uh, top left of the intersection to make a good turn, uh, acceptable turn radius for cars. Um, also included in this project are curb um, improvements to the lower left um, that connect back up to the existing sidewalk and then the lower right to make it uh, ADA, current ADA accessible standards. Next slide. Um, also included in this project when it was first um, envisioned was to redo this area. There used to be a bus stop here. 
There is no longer a bus stop here. However, this area is pretty unimproved. It's a dirt lot. There's a crumbling um, asphalt kind of uh, curb there. So this project still proposes to have a concrete curb here to kind of uh, shore off that area, keep the pavement from crumbling on the end, plant a couple trees there with the tree replacements we have to do for this project, and then also turn this into a um, loading zone area for people to drop off and pick up passengers, either for the rail trail or going down to the village on the busier days so you don't have to drive all the way down there. Uh, next slide. Um, this is our tree replanting plan. There's space here in the lower lot for about 28 trees. We only anticipate having to remove four trees, so two to one would be eight trees in this area, so there are plenty of room. Um, there's also multiple species here. Um, you may or may not know that it is very hard to procure trees right now. So we have multiple species to choose from uh, as approved by an arborist that we had come assess both this area and then the trees um, to remove. Next slide. So um, upon council's recommendation, we would return to council um, to authorize the bid and then also approve the final plant specifications estimate and the coastal development permit for the tree removal um, with the aim of constructing this before next summer, so late winter to spring of next year. Um, there's currently $300,000 budgeted for this project, the RTC grant and general fund that has already been dedicated to this project. We've expended about 30,000 on um, planning efforts in coordination with the RTC and anticipate the remaining funding to be sufficient to construct the project. And there's the recommendation and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Do we have any council questions? I had one question. In plan three, the size of the sidewalk, is that is there a standard or is there between one, two, and three, the size of the sidewalk? So one and two had a 5.5 foot and three has a five foot. The ADA standard is only 36 inches. So it far exceeds the ADA standard. We like to do five and a half because that's considered enough width for like two wheelchairs to be passing each other at the same time. But five foot is pretty much what you'll see around town because for a very long time that was the standard around the state. Great, thank you. Another question. Um, in the area that you highlighted where a total planting 28 trees, are you only planting on doing the two to one replacement, so eight total trees at this time, or is there plans for more trees than that? The intention is to replace them two to one in this in, in one of these areas. Okay. And is that generally what Capitola does? For removals, yes. Um, is there any specifics on the size of the trees that you'll be replacing the trees with? That's a great question. I'm not sure what the standard is. <laughs> and I know that very often staff look for the two look standard for the one look standard. Uh, our replanting is two to one and it's a five gallon tree. For commercial, we require a larger replanting. Um, Could we this. have larger replanting for this project? We have, uh, we could look at the budget. We have quite a bit of money in our um, planting fund right now that we could most likely utilize larger trees than the five gallon. I mean, I'd be happy with three to one too, if there's room for 28. And, and then my other question is, are the trees getting replaced of the same species? Are they oak or are they one to one given the species being removed? Ideally, we'd want to replace them with coastal live oak, which are the ones being removed, especially the 40-inch ones of coastal live oak. There was only one. Oh, there's one, one live oak. oak. The other three are other species. Ideally, we'd we replace them all with oak trees. With oaks, great. Yes. Okay. Depending on availability, because it has been hard to procure trees here lately.
yeah, where yeah, where they go. So I'd prefer larger and more light books. Mm -hmm. Oh, we heard you. Um, I just had a question. I saw um, sort of some of the crosswalk or like bike path enhancement. Is that sort of is that going to be tacked on to this project as well? Yes. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Any public comment online? There are no speakers on. Okay. We can come back to council. Any other deliberation? Comments? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I see on, oh, well, I see it. It says alternative two, but I thought that's, which, which one were we going with? Three. I don't see an of that in the slide. Oh, here it is. Okay. So yeah, it's the same. I was just curious about the crosswalks because I see it looks like very robust at the bottom. Um, but then I don't see any other like green or crosswalk marking on the other three um, sort of crossings. Yeah, I think right. So that one... Actually, Julia, would you mind putting up? Which slide, slide do you want? Which slide? Um, the one that shows the intersection, the plans with the intersection of Park and Monterey. Yep, there you go. Okay, so the top there is a standard marking for we have a Shero, we have the marking for the bike crossing there i think the one you're talking about is the one on the bottom so there's a dual crossing there because we anticipate the rail trail being one of the entrances being there and rather to have people who are biking kind of like dart out at random across the street to go down the hill into the village we kind of want to guide them into a lane to safely cross the road and also for cars to expect bikes to be crossing that way to safely then go down into the village. So that's why there's two way marking there and it's a little more visible. So drivers and bikes know that that's what's supposed to be happening in that intersection. Okay. And the other um, three are just going to be like the white stripes without any green. Correct. Okay. And um, is there any possibility of flashing lights or any so typically you can't, or all the time, you can't put flashing lights in intersections, stop controlled intersections. Would we, would we do that green paint on, on the bottom there before the rail trail is put in? It seems like that could be potentially confusing. Agreed. Likely not. And that project will, yeah. So we, that we probably hold off on that until that project's actually constructed. But maybe include the green Correct. Yes, the other stand. From park down to the Correct. Thank you. Any other comments? Does anybody like to? I would like to uh, move to make a motion for the pedestrian pathway from Upper Beach and Village Beach parking lot to Monterey Ave. I'll second that. And just to clarify, we're base three. Alter alternative number three. Base three. Uh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe we have a roll call, please. Sure. Okay. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll go to. 9D, this is our long-term strategic planning. We'll provide feedback regarding the development process for a longer-term city of Capitola strategic plan. Thank you so much. I'll just um, give it a second here. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm going to adjust this. Yes, so we'll be talking about long-term strategic planning. And uh, we're here this evening because in the March budget goals and priorities meeting, you did direct staff to develop strategic goals for our city and allocate money towards that project. So what is a strategic plan? Well, it's very exciting. 
Uh, you'll hear this a lot. It is a roadmap for the future that is often used to prioritize an organization's or city's initiatives, goals, and resources. So this is really about the big picture. Where do you want the city to go? And is often summarized into about five or six focus areas that also align with the city's vision and mission. Next slide. Thank you. So this is just a visual example of several um, plans with staff analyzed and um, read. Many of our neighboring jurisdictions have strategic plans in place, uh, such as the county. The, the, the top one is from the town of Los Gatos and the city of Watsonville. This is just kind of a visual. So moving forward, um, as I mentioned, we did look at many examples from um, jurisdictions both larger and more similar in size to the city of Capitola. And um, what we really kind of concluded is often the process is very similar, but the scope and the scale of that process changes really based on the size of the community and um, that community's resources. So for example, um, the, San, the county of Santa Cruz um, strategic plan um, is in place currently, the five-year plan, and um, was really the sole project of their assistant county administrative officer. Most of her time was dedicated to developing that plan in 2018 with also the help of an entire steering committee, several other staff members, uh, extensive community outreach, which you can imagine makes sense because it was for the entire county. Uh, looking at another example that was included in the packet um, for the city of King City, again, they followed a similar process, but on a smaller scale. And the focus areas that I mentioned earlier are listed here um, for each of those plans that were also included in the packet. Perfect. So what does that process actually look like? I've kind of outlined it here. We would start with fact-finding. That would be a citywide needs assessment and analysis then move forward into public outreach with a series of workshops or surveys or both, um, really gathering that information and data and using it to identify what are those proposed goals, what are the focus areas of the strategic plan, and then uh, bringing that information to yourselves where we can really focus on what is your vision and are we moving in the right direction based on the input we've received you know, from the community and from staff with that needs assessment? That would lead to drafting the plan and allow for fine tuning where um, that, the, the proposed plan would be given to council for review and lead hopefully to its final adoption at a council meeting. So I think, yep, I had some that's some cool animation there. Um, we've identified um, that the different steps we would recommend would be done in partnership with a consultant, um, really leaning on an expert to get some of the work done and also really um, guide us in this process. And then, of course, also council's time would be very important to the process as well. So moving forward to kind of reiterate some of the considerations to look forward to in this process, is it wouldn't necessarily only be the city manager department. It will really lean on all of the city departments to give their um, feedback and their buy-in. We would be looking for community input, leaning into transparency, having the process available, and the outcome. We would need council time as well for some of that visioning. And then, of course, I know I've already mentioned staff time. But then I also want to just say uh, the follow-through, once we have that adopted plan, really focusing on how we use it and that we are leaning on the plan in all of our future decision making. Otherwise, why do we have it in the first place, right? So just kind of bringing that up now. And that's really all I have now. I'm looking to you for feedback um, regarding our process in the development of a strategic plan. And I can answer questions as well. Thank you. Thanks, Chloe. Mm -hmm. Do we have questions? Chloe, remind me, is this what we did with the Nicoles with the Optimal Solutions? So that's a great question. I think it's very similar, but that was very specific to just the community grant program, correct? Gotcha. So it was kind of, and I know, I think um, our recreation um, division also did kind of like a strategic planning program, but it was for that division specifically. This would be for the whole city. And you might have said this already, or it's probably in the report, but can you tell me again when the last time we did this? That should have been in my report. We never have. Never. Okay. 
we, we think about it all the time. <laughs> think about it. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, oh, sorry, I got sidetracked by the joke there. Um, I, I uh, value the importance of strategic plans. I've done several strategic plans before. I do also have concerns that if we have a five or 10 year strategic plan that every two years when we get a new council member and they come in and go, I care about this, the answer will be, sorry, that's not in our strategic plan. And so I do see within here that some cities um, have kind of a one or two year operational plan in addition to or enveloped within a strategic plan. Is that something that we would consider during our workshops or is that something that staff would bring back to us? I just want to ensure that future councils aren't um, prohibited from being able to set goals themselves as well. I think that's a really good point and I, I see Jamie getting ready for a response. Um, I do believe if you were to direct us to include kind of a smaller scale operational plan, that we would absolutely be able to do that, and that would address some of your concerns. Okay, so if, if this council were to create five, seven, eight, ten, whatever year strategic plan, but then within that was a two year operational plan, then the next time the council changes over, new people would have an opportunity to weigh in on the operational plan, if not the strategic. Exactly. Plan. Okay, thank you. I would just say to that that I, I think it would be important to build into the language of the plan that it should be a living document and should be open to change through new city council members, but just to serve as, you know, we we have this massive plan that we've been working on and refining over the years and, you know, things change and people's opinions change, but I think it's, it's good to have that still. Um, mm -hmm. Additionally, uh, I had a question about the... Um, I see here, it says um, City Council half-day workshop. I'm wondering if that is um, standard from your research or if the consultant might have other opinions for that, like, you know, to what degree City Council is involved in the strategic planning. I think it depends on the scope. I believe, for example, with the county, there was, I think, even a longer, it might have been a, a full-day off-site retreat, multiple workshops. So again, though, that was for the county. That's a larger scope. We would certainly be able to, with the help of the consultant, identify a balance. Does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Great. And I mean, I think what we were trying to do is come up with kind of a middle-of-the-road approach. You know, not go as intense as the county did, uh, but at the same time do something that's a little bit more robust because we haven't done a strategic planning effort in basically as long as this generation of leadership has been around the, in the city. So trying to find that middle ground, we certainly, there are some jurisdictions that would allocate, you know, two all day sessions for a workshop. Um, other times, you know, people might just do it as a, a you know, something as part of a regular evening meeting. So we were kind of thinking that middle ground of a half day workshop, but we're happy to get input from the council or from the consultants and see if we want to go deeper or not so deep. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> okay. Any public comment on this item? Anybody online? There are no speakers on Zoom. Okay. Uh, we can take this back to council uh, for comments. The only comment I would have is a, definitely a, a living document that you know things are always going to change in our community, so we can make changes as we. <clears throat> And when new council members come aboard. Yeah, I guess along those lines, and maybe this is should have been more of a question, but um, you know, we we're coming off of a huge catastrophic event that was not mm -hmm. able to be planned for. Um, so as much as we can have strategies and ideas in place, um, I think coming off of what the vice mayor said too is I don't want to pigeonhole anybody that comes after us to do certain things, especially, or be held back by fixing things or doing things after if something catastrophic ever happens again. Um, that's just kind of my feeling towards this. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. And just as a brief example, when speaking with um, the people from the county who prepared that plan through 2024, one of the 
you know, the CZU fires happened within that time frame, and there was a lot of response and also shifting because of that event that happened, and that was completely um, doable. Of course, a challenge for other reasons, but but was not hindered by the, the plan. So if that kind of eases your mind. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, and just to echo what, what I'm hearing from my fellow council members is, you know, it's important for the strategic plan to have that operations element so it aligns with our, our annual goals that we set um, as council members, I think it would take away if we did, from that if we didn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think and a component that's going to be really important about the strategic plan, and I'm sure during our five-day event when we're talking about it in Hawaii, <laughs> um, that, you know, I think we really need to uh, ensure that we bring in a regional um, component to the strategic plan. We're hearing that the county already did it. I mean, the city of Santa Cruz has done it. There's no sense of um, not ensuring that whatever they've created is also part of our plan because we're part of an entire county, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of those things um, are intertwined. Um, and then lastly, we just came back from the Central Coast Community Power um, annual meeting, and they had a really unique format for their budget and their operations that was just in a really um, community-friendly mm -hmm. form where, you know, during our strategic plan, it might be like a 1,000 pages, and instead they had it in like, a 15, 20 page um, document that was, um, that did go out to just not us, but to everybody and the consumers. I think we should think about that as a tool for us in our, um, for our community to be able to access that and really, um, so they can have an idea on what we do. So those are just my thoughts and I'd be happy to um, move the recommended action of providing, oh, I gave you feedback, that's all I need to do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. I appreciate it. Is there any other feedback? Um, I guess that I would err on the side of a longer term strategic plan than a less long. You know, I think it would be more valuable to have a 10 year than a two year, for example. Okay. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it's something that. I'd like to work with our consultant on how to structure something like that. And I'm kind of imagining sort of a, a plan that starts out with pretty high level principles and kind of our focus and our, our and then gets more into it. And so there's like the more granular stuff might be refreshed every couple of years, but the higher level stuff stays static. I don't know. Just, but I think you're right. I think you do want to have a picture for where you want to end up and what that desired condition would be. But then you want to talk more pragmatically. Plan. Even if we do make a 10-year plan, those very high-level 10-year plans can still be changed by future council members, and that's an important aspect of that, I think. Yeah. And then is this something that would be visited every year? Or like, what? Or is that what we're kind of trying to figure so out? Ask. It would almost be like another form of like a budget meeting. So my vision... <laughs> which may or may not matter, is that the, <laughs> the operational plan would be re revisited more frequently because that would be moderating a shorter length of time and that maybe we would restructure how the budget principles and goals meeting is, um, is conducted so that it's kind of slightly higher level and it fits into this entire process. And that's something we could talk to the consultant about how to achieve that as we're addressing this you know, making the strategic plan work. So I hope that answers your question. Or maybe even as more when new council members come aboard every two years. Absolutely. Okay. Is that enough? In yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. Thank you, Chloe. Mm -hmm. All right. So we can take it to 9E. This is the item about the interim building official. Uh, we are recommended to adopt a resolution for an exception to the 180-day wait period per government code listed there and approve the appointment of Robin Woodman as the interim building official retired annuant. 
Yes, so it's me still. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Mayor and Council. Uh, this is a quick item. We are excited to welcome Robin as our interim retired annuitant, our interim building official, while the city does recruit for an actual employee to fill that role. Um, this is a really good win-win way to address not having a building official employee at, the, at this time while also opening it up and looking for someone to fill that role um, at some point within the next year. So you may remember there are very specific rules to appoint retired annuitants. Um, they need to work less than 960 hours in a fiscal year. They're paid only an hourly rate with no other additional benefits from the city. And in this case, under this section of code 21221H, this is a situation where we're having Robin serve as an interim building official. So that, that role specifically, as we do recruit, and we do have an open recruitment for an employee in that role. So the reason we're having you adopt a resolution during general government is a CalPERS requirement that she will be starting prior to the 180-day wait period, uh, which is generally required for retirees. In this case, this is necessary to fill a critically needed position, which is within the bounds of the CalPERS rules. So my recommendation is please adopt the resolution for the exception as written here on the screen. And thank you. If you have questions, I'm here to answer them. Any questions? Any public comment? Anybody out there? There's no one on Zoom. Okay. Take it back to council. Uh, move approval of staff recommendation. Second. <laughs> Great. First and a second, may have a roll call, please. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Hi. Thank you so much. And 9F. City Council appointments to city advisory bodies. The recommended action is to appoint members of the public to the Capitola Arts and Cultural Commission. I believe this is Julia. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. To close us out this evening, we have a quick appointment to our Art and Cultural Commission. So per Government Code 549, 7-4, the city clerk's office received notice of an unscheduled vacancy because a member of the commission resigned from their position. We recruited for the vacancy by publishing a notice in the newspaper as well as on our social media website and requesting word of mouth. Um, we received three applications. We currently actually have two unscheduled vacancies for the commission. However, one of them is for an artist position and none of the applications on file meet the requirements to fill that vacancy. So in accordance with the bylaws of the Art and Cultural Commission, the commission reviewed the applicants and recommends the appointment of Mario Beltramo. This would be for a term expiring in December of 2024. With that, the recommended action is that the city council appoint one member of the public to the Art and Cultural Commission. I'm available for any questions. Uh, I have a question. The agenda report mentions the COE received one application for a youth member appointment. Was that a typo or is that just for informational purposes? It is for informational purposes. That appointment will be coming to you at the next city council meeting because the COE still has to review that application in accordance with their bylaws. So it's just a random fun add-in for your knowledge. It. Happy to hear it. Okay. <laughs> but it's not factually incorrect. No, no it's not. <laughs> it's <legit. laughs> um, and then does, is there any insight as to the decision making? I, I don't question the choices of the commission. They know who is best for their commission. But I'm wondering if there was any insight as to how the decision was made, um, only because I noticed that one of the applicants works specifically with the arts, the performing arts community, and it looks like the person that was chosen what, um, is not related in that way. I don't know these people, so I'm not passing sure. any judgment, but I'm just curious as, as if there's any insight as to the decision making. So the Art and Cultural Commission reviewed the applications during an open Brown Act meeting. So members of the public had an opportunity to comment on um, each of the 
applicants was invited to attend the meeting. It's actually in the bylaws that they're required to attend one meeting prior to being appointed. As for specific insight, I believe that our staff liaison for the commission is present at tonight me or tonight's meeting. Nikki could probably speak to it further. Or our council representative who may have been in attendance that night as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk on this. That's we did have a, a chance to meet with everybody and informal uh, interviewing of them and listening to all their experiences. He was our next choice. So Mario was our, our next choice. Although we want to bring them all on eventually, this, this is where we stand with Mario. That works for me. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? I have a question. I'm sorry. I didn't really understand um, the that there were two unscheduled vacancies, but only why could only one be appointed? So we received two resignations from the commission. Um, we have applications on file, but one of the vacancies is tied to an occupation as an artist. So the person who fills that vacancy needs to be a working artist, essentially. And so we contacted the applicants on file to see if any of them could perhaps fill that requirement, and none of them responded in the affirmative that they could. Um, typically on the application, there's a check box. When you submit your application, you can select which type of vacancy you're applying for. Like, for example, with the Finance Advisory Committee, there are business representatives as well as at-large members. With the Art and Cultural Committee, there are at-large members, and then there are also artist members. And so none of the applicants on file are able to meet that requirement for that vacancy. And for the um, artist requirement, does that need to be like your primary source of income? Is that what it is? Or what's the definition of artist? I don't believe it has to be the primary source of income. I would need to review the bylaws to be 100% certain. But I do believe it needs to be like profession. They need to have an artist as a profession. Not their primary source of income, but they need to be working and producing art for sale, I believe. Right, and nobody else qualified. Exactly. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So any artists out there? Time to apply. We do accept applications year round. Any public comment on this item? Anybody online? There are no speakers with their hands raised. Okay, we can come back to council. I'll uh, move approval of um, the commission recommendation. I'll second. Appointment to the commission. Mario. <laughs> All trauma. Sorry. Great. That's a first and a second. Let's do a voice vote. All those in favor. Aye. 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 <gasps> Great. Okay. That takes us to our very last item which is number 10, adjournment. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Have a great evening and a good weekend.